I figured I'd do a video um, just based on the Ron Ransom palette. I'll talk about the colors in a moment. I'm just taking a 11 by 15, a quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua, 100% cotton, and just saturating it with water with a medium sized hake brush. And while it does this, while I do this, it'll absorb the water, it'll um, stretch the paper, etc., etc. Okay. Now, on to the Ron Ransom palette. So I'm going to re-wet certain areas of it, and I'll add where need be, but I'll just kind of go through it and point it out. So we have light red ox oxide. Usually I use Venetian red, which... Um, it might show up a little bit different on camera. This one, a um, little bit, I guess maybe a little bit red, or maybe this is a little bit more orange. Anyway, uh, light red oxide, alizarin crimson. So we skip over this one. Burnt umber, burnt sienna, raw sienna, lemon yellow, ultramarine, and Payne's gray. So it's a pretty basic palette. Um, it's just uh, simplified just to introduce people to painting and it's for a very fast and loose painting style. So I paint in the fast and loose style, but I've kind of adopted different palettes, played with different colors and take different approaches. So at the end of the day, if you're interested in fast and loose stuff, there's a lot of us out there that are um, making videos on it. A lot of us are in communication with each other. Uh, one of the Facebook pages that we all a lot of us utilize is Ron Ranson Disciples, where we use the Hake brush and we use a similar palette or, like I said, play around with different colors. Um, yeah, so if you're into that stuff, I mean, check us out on there. Uh, artists that utilize it are um, Stephen Cronin, Joe Menza, Lois Davidson, uh, David Usher. Uh, Matthew Clemens, um, those are just, just quick few people off the top of my head. They make videos and put things out online. So um, I think we're going to play with this palette. Lately I've been doing the tonalism, so we might have a tonalism vibe with it, but we're going to get just different colors and play around. So this is raw sienna. Kind of just have no idea planned. I have been thinking about doing a uh, painting that's more interior forest lately, or just a little uh, swamp or a stream. I don't know if I'm going to do it with this one. Right now I'm just kind of just adding color to the paper. We'll see what happens. Okay, uh, I can take a lizard and crimson. I could put that in the sky. You can take a few different colors. Whatever you want to play around with. I find that the alizarin crimson does not show through very well at the end of the painting, which is totally fine because skies you want to be um, just light and soft. The approach that was given by Ron Ranson was, and he would use paint straight from the tube. He would just put it right in and put big, uh, very intense quantities of pigment and as it dried it would soften up but um i kind of go on the the idea of putting light in and then it drying very light and being very soft at the end okay let's see so like i said i really have no big thing planned some people, so I want to kind of just demonstrate the palette, or at least what comes to mind as I play around with it. This is Payne's Gray. Payne's Gray is a mixture of blue and black. The brand that I have on the palette is Da Vinci brand. Um, Ron Ransom was a big proponent of uh, the Cotman watercolor brand. But um, you can use Cotman, you can use the Van Gogh brand, uh, Da Vinci, 
anything like that. You don't need a super expensive Daniel Smith brand to do that. And I'm not knocking Daniel Smith. They have very good colors and awesome stuff. I'm just saying, um, if you're going to play around with this, you could just play with light colors and whatnot. So that's Payne's Gray up in here. Some people will take the Payne's Gray and mix uh, Lizarin into it. Uh, I think that's a formula that Ron Ransom would have in his books. You'd say kind of mauvish. You can leave it like that. And it would just play around very quickly uh, in the sky. They could use the term uh, lubricating the paper almost, where you'd wet the paper and then put the raw sienna in it. But I'm not quite sure if he's done that. I might have just adopted that from, um, yeah, I think he did that. But Stephen Cronin was a big influence on me starting out. So I think I did a lot more wet and wet than Ron Ranson might have done starting out. I feel like I haven't painted in a few days. Last night we stayed up late watching uh, Star Wars Episode Five. It's probably like the millionth time I've seen it. It was good. Uh, then we watched some documentaries after that. And then by the time we looked at the clock, it was super late. It was three in the morning. And all day today, I've been, there's an uh, old veteran that I am friends with. And I kind of adopted him. He's a friend, a friend now at this point. And he had placed a uh, pickup order with Walmart and asked me to go get it. So it was a lot of um, back and forth on, forth on the phone with Walmart trying to get it, see if it was ready and whatnot. I finally got it around nine o'clock. I'm not knocking Walmart because I know that their employees are working really hard during this time period. And it just shows that they're, they're dealing with a lot. Okay, light red oxide and ultramarine. And it's been a while since I played with this, just this, this palette alone. I mix those two together for far distant purples and I'm not sure if Ron Ranson utilized it for that purpose but I use it with um, my palette in that manner mainly from something that James Fletcher Watson said he has uh, he ha he's pa he passed away but he had some books out as well on watercolor painting and his were a little bit more detailed I'd say than Ron Ranson but I think it would still fall into the fast and loose pure watercolors. But he would have this mixture for far background, and then he'd switch his blue to a uh, different one for closer up. But I've kind of adopted that as a go-to mixture for background. One thing I want to mention, and I don't remember what artist had said this, but in their book they're saying okay somebody gave me a recipe to mix this color but they didn't say what concentration what uh how much water how much um what brand etc etc so sometimes you're not going to get the same results and you're going to maybe fall into your own formulas and patterns and see what works for you i hope that makes sense Ultramarine blue. Um, you can mix ultramarine with uh, the burnt umber, uh, burnt sienna, sorry. And that'll give you a grayish. And if you use more of the burnt sienna, you get more foreground, um, more popping forward. Still really haven't decided what I want this scene to be. I'm 
It seems to be a composition I've been doing a lot lately with kind of that water in the middle. What else? I like using the um, burnt umber as I start moving towards darks. So I'll kind of mix that and put that in, see if there's some variation with it. Now there's like a lot you can do, uh, different paths you could take at this point. You can dry it off and then do your second layer and then kind of start calling it done. Um, you can continue uh, tickling it, moving paint around, and just let the paint slowly dry, increase your concentration of pigment. Just depends on your uh, per personal preference. It's actually been a long time since I've read a Ron Ranson art book, so what I'll have to do is kind of flip through them again and give you better um, interpretation of it. This is, I guess, essentially two years of watercolor painting. This is where I'm at now and how I interpret it. This is Payne's Gray right in here. I'm just uh, absolutely in love with Payne's Gray as the banked edge of any type of water. Ron Ranson, if I remember correctly in his book, was not a fan of use, using it just by itself. Um, and I'm going to refer to James Fletcher Watson because, like I said, very similar. James Fletcher, though, would use it by itself as far distant water. I like to use it um, for that edge, and I also like to use it as the base of foreground um, foliage. Okay, so kind of just put things in. And like I said, here you can dry it off. Where I deviate is that like I like to, to tickle and experiment with it. And here's one thing I like to do. I like to take the raw sienna and I like to stipple it into the wet and wet. And this is the glowing outline of a tree. So this is the foliage that would be catching the light. Then as I move my way into the foliage, I switch it up. This is light red oxide. I usually use Venetian red, but like I said, I want to use just pure Ron Ransom palette to show you all. And then you start bringing in a kind of green on the inside. Unfortunately, I have um, difficulty with green. And you know, you can get it from the lemon yellow with the ultramarine, and you can get it from lemon yellow and um, the Payne's gray. Those are the two ways I believe but that's the only two ways you can get it I um, would add thallow blue to this mixture and that's again from James Fletcher Watson when I mix that with the air tones it kind of pushes a little greenish but I'm not using that in this like I said we're just using the Ron Ranson colors so this is moving more towards the interior of the foliage the thicker spots of the tree do that on this one too Bring down reflections in the water. And then I can get darker, ultramarine, Payne's gray. And this is still wet and wet, so it's going to disperse. And then when I dry off, I then do a uh, stippled texture over it. I didn't draw trunks in yet, but I'm going to put that down there just kind of 
the base underneath to show how that would go. A big thing with Ron Ranson is uh, scraping. Uh, Joe Menza is really good at that. He, he does that in mountains and whatnot. He kind of took, I'd say, Ron Ranson technique and applied it to uh, scenes that would be Bob Rossian. And Stephen Cronin is very good at the scraping as well. Every time I'd watch a video of them scraping, they'd always talk about not overdoing it. Um, what's taking place is you're pushing the, uh, the paint around. You're just taking that and you're just moving it on the paper. Different papers will react differently to it. And the thing that you're scraping with will affect it. Here, it's just um, the smooth original flat edge of it, which is what I think is best. If I took the um, edge that I had cut or broke, it doesn't work as well. And you can use it to scrape out grass. Here, I took the sharp edge. The sharp edge is just gonna damage the paper and it's going to um, backfill with the uh, paint. It's gonna get dark. Now that's totally fine, that backfilling. When I say damaging the paper, that's, um, that's fine. What you, that's what takes place when you're watercoloring. There's damage happening uh, whenever it is wet and wet. It's moving the fibers and um, affecting it. So even just painting alone is doing an, have an effect on the fibers of the paper. It is hard to paint back over those spots, though, if you do that. Uh, background, some people will take. It's a little too wet for me to really scrape trunks. We could have scraped trunks here. I might have to just do a slight dry off and then try to pull it. Let's do that. Okay, this is where you really want to um, experiment and practice. The paper is still damp. I'm going to try to lift it up and see if I can get it to sh there. You see that sheen that's happening? And that sheen, you'll start learning and experimenting with different levels of dryness. And I was able to scrape here when I originally went for it. I got that back fill. So it's still wet, but it's different levels of wetness. You can um, put in tree trunks, whatnot, in the background and play around with it. It's fun. Um, I think um, referencing Joe Menza a lot, I believe he will scrape out um, fence lines. Stephen Cronin will, if you scrape small and whatnot, he'd do distant um, power lines. And Lois Davidson. I believe she scrapes out small fence lines and whatnot, so it's versatile. I could go up the side and do trunks all the way up and do thicker trunks. I could come from the front and do that. There's a lot of different things you can do with it. Now I'm going to add a little. Well, I did that to dry that, so let me dry it off all the way now. Now, it's dry enough right here, and um, this is where kind of personal style comes in. I can go over these and bring more definition to them, or I can leave it as a soft background and bring something more mid or foreground and make it more um, crisp 
and that gives an interesting atmospheric effect. Uh, some people will take the hake, and they could put all the tree in in one step, right, like this in the background. Two people that are really good at that, David Usher, and uh, I haven't mentioned Posey Gaines yet. P-O-S-E-Y Gaines. He has some really great videos, and um, he has a really good technique with laying it in. And with this, I'm going to do a foreground element. I'm going to leave these guys soft in the background. So I'm going to mix a dark. And for me, whenever I use this palette, whenever I say I mix a dark, it just becomes ultramarine, Payne's gray, burnt sienna. It's whatever I can get on it to kind of um, just get that taking place. Kind of show you how they would put it in. They put it in this fashion, probably. They're very good with a hake brush. This is a good time to introduce the rigger. The rigger is um, just a fine line brush. And there is a third brush that uh, Ron Ranson would utilize. I believe it would be a flat like a quarter or a half inch flat and it kind of works for like buildings and whatnot. I, I have one. I don't really ever utilize it once in a blue and blue moon. I usually just stick with these two. The rigger that I use is a black velvet. Number one. Um, I'm just shouting out a lot of people today. Uh, Rick, uh, I think is a big proponent of the, um, the, the black velvet and I have a few of their brushes based off of his recommendation in his videos now this is a small little bush I can build up some stuff on the outside And build that whole thing right here and then bring it around I like to very loosely scrape in trunks and whatnot once in a while I think it's fun uh, kind of switches up the feel of things this is uh, raw sienna kind of emulate that glow that's back there, but more pronounced, defined. It will put a big old foreground trunk. Now, with, um, this once again just makes in a dark. You can use the hake. And you can use it a lot of different ways to get like a textured trunk. Um, leave gaps if you want to put foliage in and whatnot. You can, there's people that like do that left to right motion as they go up. You can get a chiseled point and scrape up it. There's a lot of different um, techniques that people utilize there. I'll even take the card and play around with it. But I go back and forth. I'll use the card there. I'll use um, I'll use a rigger to do these trees, even of the same thickness. It's just um, kind of whatever's in my hand or whatever just strikes me at the moment. Sometimes I'll darken up these backsides because it's still wet, so it kind of gives a wet and wet effect throughout. Um, the rigger comes from the rigging on ships when they would paint the uh, pictures of ships and whatnot. And this would be used for the rigging. Here, I just use it as a line tool, but I can take it on its side and add a texture effect. In fact, I'm quite fond of using it in that fashion.
and then use the hake to put foliage in. And, you know, there's different degrees that people go to with foliage and whatnot. Um, I'm going to grab some lemon yellow, see if I can get some green in here. Lemon yellow in the mixture to get some green. One thing, and I'm trying to do this more as like a beginner um, tutorial type painting. You know, kind of introduce you all to it and just to switch gears for me I haven't painted in like what two days like I said so I feel, I feel almost rusty here's a little bit of um, burnt sienna in there too Get that reds in there now one thing that I found that helps and I believe the person I learned it from was Stephen Cronin is that if I'm putting this in after a while you see how it's all wet right here if I start putting over it it just starts blurring together which is an interesting effect but sometimes it doesn't work all the time sometimes you want the textured effects to be there and you don't want it to be all blurred so um it was what Stephen Cronin that would then dry it off and then do another layer on top of it there was one point near the beginning of my painting when I was you know learning from them where I think me Joe Menza and Matthew Clemens were experimenting and talking about um, using like straight lemon yellow from the tube and stippling it right over it and it would be very uh, crisp. It was very impressionist. <clears throat> of all things, this tree trunk is like killing me. I'm not in love with the shape of it. Know, the thickness of this tree trunk it's just too um too linear so i'm just playing around with it i'm taking the darks and putting it on top of this and you can use the rigor for grass strokes and whatnot. Um, like I said, I'm trying to stay within more of a Ron Ranson feel, or at least my interpretation of it without going too crazy. One thing. A lot of the people that follow the fast and loose and this style will do they'll add either somebody walking a dog or somebody fishing or a boat or somebody standing there um, or birds we have dry here so birds super simple you just put them in as little like V's or little dots whatever works um, with ducks in the water that was um, pretty common for us to play around with well um where do, let's put a fisherman in he really doesn't have to be super defined or anything like that i however do have a little bit of trouble with the steadiness with it so there's a thing called a mall an artist mall where it's a long stick I think it was rounded on the end or it had leather on the end so it wouldn't smear stuff and you'd sit it and you can rest your hand against it I use the um, hake brush sometimes if I need to do it it's a little too wet so you use the rigger just to draw a straight line for a fishing pole I'm gonna make it a little too thick One thing you can use if you have difficulty with this is um, 
You could literally just use a, uh, an artist pen or something and draw them in. There you go. That line, like I said, is a little too thick. I'm not sure why uh, it's not working out for me, but like I said, I'm just trying to go kind of fast with it, but also be super loose with it to um, get y'all to try it out. And you could add like little elements around them. But let's dry it off. We'll sign it and we'll take a quick look. So, like I said, that was a super fast, um, fast and loose painting, utilizing the Ron Ransom palette. Um, a lot did take place within it. So, it was a minimized palette. I think it was, what, eight colors? And honestly, you could maybe add one or two more and you'd have a pretty well-rounded palette. And so there's that. Uh, we only used two brushes, the Hake brush and the Rigger. And we were able to get a lot of different textures and effects with it. We used the card for scraping. Blower dryer, obviously, to dry things off and quicken things. But within this, a lot of things took place. We had wet and wet in the background, uh, foreground, and we got that soft effect. Then we had started shaping some of those trees in the background in the wet and wet stage as well. Then we dried off, we put in these guys and we didn't even do a dry off again. We just put in this foreground element, I think. Um, here, that's where we saw the use of the rigger where we could use it for uh, grass, a little bit of sideways, just texture technique. I think I demonstrated a little bit of foliage with it, but then just use the rigger for the rest of it. Um, sorry, the hake, we, we could get the textured and then wet and wet so you could get different effects with the hake just putting paint in so a lot of different things you can do uh with those simple tools in a very short amount of time uh, the things that you really want to focus on is well just like using those tools to the fullest amount trying to get an organic feel to everything and that's what i meant when i was having difficulty here it was just so um so so straight so uh the same shape and that was um it's not organic organic is something that it twists and turns and has feels to it um but yeah we, we even scraped out some branches and whatnot just willy-nilly just to get an effect there so it's a really cool way to paint uh impressionist style as i wear to fall within uh you could say it has atmospheric effects due to um perspective and whatnot we did talk a little bit about color well, we talked yeah about color mixing and whatnot with it so i'll try to do some more of these for y'all if y'all like it and um you know because i'm sure some sometimes my exploration into tonalism gets quite dark with um the monochromatics and whatnot so i hope you had fun and i'll uh, talk to y'all soon have a great day bye